I'm Grady Edwards with Bo Gorseski. Welcome to Discast, a podcast from the Horry County Schools Digital Integration Team. We believe that educational technology can be used to transform teaching and learning in the classroom. We strive to spotlight the good work our teachers are doing across our county and hope our discussions will inspire possibilities for your classroom. Your journey into the world of EdTech starts right now. A very happy Monday to all our listeners. We've got a fantastic episode for you today, but before we get to that, we at the Discast would like to thank everyone for subscribing to our podcast and YouTube channel. Please continue to spread the word. Just a reminder, we can be found wherever you get your podcast, and you can watch our vodcast via our YouTube channel. See the links in the description for more details. Thanks, Bo. In today's episode, we'd like to highlight and shout out all of our schools for the work they have done this year in regards to computational thinking and coding. For many, coding can be very intimidating and somewhat scary for teachers in regards to course implementation. But our HCS teachers have dived in headfirst and really done some incredible things. You can go to any number of our schools and see teachers implementing computational thinking into their lessons. Also, many of our teachers have checked out or even purchased codable robots. Bo, you've done a lot of work with these codable robots. Tell us a little bit more about them. Well, just a reminder, the Digital Integration Specialist Team has a number of codable robots and tools for you to check out if you're interested. We are also in the process of creating several YouTube tutorials on information and implementation strategies for these tools. In fact, I mentioned the Q-Robot in our third Discast episode. You'll find an entire playlist with videos like this called Getting to Know on our Dear Dis YouTube channel. Excellent! And speaking of coding and computational thinking, we have two very special guests who have done an incredible job of making code a norm in their school. Our very own Megan Cox was able to sit down with Bianca Basher and Samantha Coy of Burgess Elementary to discuss how they have implemented code into their classroom. Let's listen in. Hi everyone, Megan Cox here at Burgess Elementary today, and I am here with my friend Bianca Basher, a first grade teacher, and Samantha Coy, the principal. And we are here to talk about some coding and computational thinking happening in their building. So welcome guys. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, we are so glad to have you. Um, Bianca, I would love just to start with you and just to kind of hear about um, how you really got started with coding in your classroom. I know that you have done amazing things, um, especially with first graders, and I've seen it in action. So I would love to hear just, you know, how you really got interested, how you got started with this. I have um, really enjoyed teaching my students about coding and computational thinking this year. I started out by um, going to a summer district training and that was very informative and I was able to bring a lot of that back to my school and in PLCs I introduced all of those apps and robots and all of that training that I received in the summer district training with um, the other teachers in my school. So I shared with kindergarten, first and second grade teachers. I also started out in my classroom by um, teaching them about Cubeto. It's a really awesome robot and it's so fun. I just showed them just the simple blocks and how um, each color makes the robot do an action that you want it to do. We, um, I gave it to them and said, here you go, and they went at it. And it was wonderful and so exciting, and they enjoyed it. And the, one of the first ways that we started out is I had them just roll a dice on the mat, and they had to code Cubeto to get from the position that he was in to where the dice was on the mat. It was really a lot of fun. And we actually started off doing it during our math game day time yeah, because sometimes our math time, we spend so much time during the week playing all the everyday math games. By the end of the week, when we have that math game day, you well, know, what <laughs> what else is there to do? We want to do something new, but yeah. something challenging and fun and exciting for them. And so they really enjoyed it a whole lot. That's great. I can definitely hear the passion in your voice. I know that um, during that summer training, it just like ignited something in you. You were so excited. You couldn't wait to take it back. Um, so it's great to hear that like just a little spark of learning something new. You just dug so deep and 
you were willing to teach others. So I know you mentioned Cubetto. That's definitely a favorite. I've seen him in action in your classroom. Um, tell me about um, how you're using Cubetto now since you've been using them for about a year now and mm -hmm. any other tools or um, coding software programs that you've introduced to your students. Well, Cubetto has definitely been a favorite for all of my students and myself. Um, I like how there's not a really a screen involved, but the board where they have to actually put in the coding blocks. I think it's very primary friendly. That's what's so yeah. great about it. Um, one thing that we've recently done is in math in unit eight, we've been doing um, shapes. And so we actually last week taped markers to Cubetto and the students coded him to draw shapes. Oh, that's amazing. And I told them that this is me thinking as an adult, I said, I don't think we can draw a circle with Cubetto. And they drew a circle. They figured wow. out that four rights or four lefts will draw a circle on Cubetto. And I was so amazed and they drew rectangles and squares and all different kinds of shapes with him. And it was so, Fun. That's amazing. For those of you listening that um, haven't seen Cubetto, first of all, look them up. We'll link some resources to them. But Cubetto um, makes 90 degree turns. So yeah, my instinct would have been like, no, he'd make squares or rectangles. But that's amazing to hear um, how they figured it out and how they have used him. And I know you've used him in several subjects. He's mm -hmm. been using math. In ELA, I know you've done work with writing. So. Yes, um, students have um, wrote stories and we have designed our own Cubetto mats and have written code to code Cubetto through their their story that they've created. It's been a lot That's of fun. Amazing. Awesome. Well, you've kind of already led into my next question um, a little bit, but I would just love to hear about some of the impact on learning that you have seen um, from doing yeah. this in your classroom. You know. Um, coding is still very new to some teachers and sometimes they're a little bit unsure of how it's going to impact um, their students instructionally and I know you've done a great job with tying it to, to standards so what kind of changes and impacts have you seen? When I first started I was really worried about them not wanting to share because I was having to put several kids with one Cubetto set but they really have truly learned to collaborate and share the materials with each other. Um, seeing them like solve the problems with coding when the robot turns left instead of right, they really listen to each other's ideas of how to solve that problem and fix it, which is really nice to see them truly listening to each other and listening to their ideas. Um, I think that's amazing too, because one thing that, um, I don't know that we, you know, spend enough time as teachers just spending an instructional time on devoting it to how do we collaborate? How do we work together? So not only are they problem solving, um, but just those soft skills of, you know, how am I a good partner? How do I listen? How do I take turns? And that's big for first graders. So that's amazing. Another thing that I've noticed is um, they have realized that there's several different ways to solve him to move to one position so they can take him in different directions and so then they have to work together as a team to figure out in which direction they want to go. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think what's really good about what I've seen in your classroom is really depending on the level of the, of the student level of the learner, you can easily take um, Cubetto and kind of adapt the activity to change the rigor of the lesson. You know, is it a student who needs a simple two or three step sequence or is it someone who can solve a challenge like how do I make something that makes right turns and right angles make a circle? So um, that's great. One other thing I'd love to hear um, a little bit more about is how you have collaborated with the other teachers in your building um, to help them incorporate coding. So I know when you came to our summer training, that was a challenge we gave you guys. Um, but I know personally, you've kind of went above and beyond and you've made it um, something that you've done throughout the year. So share with us about how you've continued to keep up that collaboration um, with the, within your building. Um, I've really enjoyed sharing these tools with other teachers because seeing the excitement with my kids has made me want to their the other teachers children to experience the same excitement and learning that my kids are and so um one way that i've done that is i have shared with my team ideas in our team meet our weekly team meetings so that they get ideas on how 
they can code him. I've went into other teachers' classrooms. I've been lucky enough to have an intern. And so I've been able to go into other teachers' classrooms and help them or teach a small group of students on how to use um, different tools, not just Cubeto, but many other coding robots. Um, some of my kids in my class have been student leaders and have been able to go to other teachers' classrooms as well and help out when I'm not able to. And so it's been really enjoyable helping other people. And what's been great about it is now the teachers are coming up with new ideas that I would have never thought about before of how they can use him in stations or during math game day that I would have never thought about. Yeah, the power of collaboration. That's Absolutely. amazing. Um, I love how you mentioned that you've you know spent time going in other teachers' classrooms as a support because I know coding is scary for a lot of people. And um, as teachers, we like to do things we know and we're comfortable with. And so I think that's really made an impact at your school people teacher other teachers don't have to feel afraid that they might not know everything about the robot so um, that's amazing that you have been able to do that this year it's been a lot of fun all right so um, one other thing I would like to kind of talk to you about is recommendations for teachers that are new to coding or just getting started because you have dug in you found a lot of resources and like I said you've helped so many other people so where would you recommend that um, maybe a new teacher or a teacher new to coding begins I think that you just need to really start very, very simple. And one thing that I've learned this year is that my kids can do it. They they teach me how to do it. I just handed them the Cubeto. I showed them the blocks and they did it. They taught themselves. They learned how to do it. I just only gave them the tools. So I think that as teachers, we need to not be worried about us knowing how to do it, but knowing that our kids can figure it out because that's the kind of thinkers that they are now. Yes, absolutely. I love it. that. Yeah. And I think um, I've seen you do that in your classroom where it's okay to let kids say the wrong answer out loud and test the wrong answer. Um, tell me about the power with coding and sometimes having the wrong answer the first time. I think that whenever they do get the wrong answer the first time or the second time or even the third time, they're like, oh, we got to fix it. We got to change it. And then when they do get it right, that excitement and the power of it and like they're they have their hands in their air and they're screaming and they're just so excited that they finally solved the code or they got it correct. It just it makes them so excited. And then it also teaches them it is OK to be wrong. It is OK yeah. to make mistakes. Absolutely. I think that's a lesson we all need to learn. And I've seen you in your classroom model that and sometimes test the wrong code or let the robot go the wrong way. Um, whether that was on purpose or not, I don't know, but it was a beautiful learning moment because when kids see the teacher doing that, then they know, you know, it's okay if I do it too. It's a safe space. And that's really where they learn um, those great problem solving skills. So thank yeah. you so much. Um, so Samantha <laughs> Coy, um, you are the principal at Burgess and I know that you have had um, a huge part in helping um, your teachers really take off with coding this year. And so I would love to hear some from you as well. Um, how did you support teachers into beginning to incorporate so much coding in their classrooms? Uh, I attended the half day session that Bianca shared early in the year. That was part of our beginning of the year PLC work. And and immediately when you and I, I did not have much knowledge or experience with coding or what resources were available. So just, you know, initially it's the wow factor of, Absolutely. you know, what, you know, this robot and that you're coding it. And immediately, uh, as you, if you think about learning and you think about real world, world skills and work skills, and the South Carolina, the profile of South Carolina graduate, it, you know, teamwork stands out, critical thinking stands out, problem solving, all of those pieces that were on there were very apparent. And, and so immediately we saw value and the district was great in having resources that we could check out, but we really had conversations that if we wanted to, if we really wanted this to stick and we really wanted teachers to run with it, that they needed the tools. So we, we found ways to get resources through different funding and teachers 
did donors choose grants and we were able to buy some with the school and we let people run with it for the first few months. We just put, put it out there. We let everybody know what resources we had purchased. We watched what was being used and we purchased more of what we thought we needed. And as teachers ran with, with coding in their classrooms in different ways, um, initially it was just the coding, but then we started to ask questions about how can we use the coding experiences and embed them in our what we what we're trying to do with our standards and in curriculum and and so Absolutely. teachers like Bianca ran with that she did a collaborative piece where um, groups wrote in writing stories fantasy stories and then had coding that went along with that and created the map and then Kubeta had to um, follow it and then they did each other's um, story right before um, the winter holiday and so we started to really um, we've been learning. It's been a learning curve for me and I know many of our teachers in what we knew was amazing up front, but then seeing other possibilities as we dug in. And so as we did that, we knew we wanted more kids to have those experiences. And so we worked with our um, library learning commons teacher. And for the week of Hour of Code, we asked her to uh, to expose all kids in the school to coding because then we knew that kids could do it. So right. like Bianca was talking about earlier, Kids had knowledge and, and we had a lot of conversations because there was angst in some class. I mean, it really is a learning curve even for me. So just let the kids teach you. Have mm -hmm. a teacher leader come in and work with a small group. You don't have to be the expert in that. We can use each other and, and use our teacher leaders and our student leaders to do that. So all kids got to experience the hour of code, coding with the hour of code. And Bianca, I got a substitute and um, Bianca went and worked with the library learning commons teacher that first day. So that was all grade levels. And they collaborated and planned together ahead of time because it was our teacher was very willing to do it but she said it's new to me so yeah, they collaborated absolutely. together and kids came out excited so teachers were wondering and then the next thing that we did was we held breakout sessions at our staff meeting where um, all teachers rotated through stations that had to do with coding so Osmo, Cubeto, Ozobot, um, different apps and websites because there are a lot of the, yes. that are free out there and so we had teacher lead we asked teacher leaders that we knew were using those tools in their classroom and we felt like we're comfortable with them and to come during staff meeting and we did I think they were like quick 10 15 minute mm -hmm. rotations and that was the staff meeting that day just for them to experience it as learners themselves and start conversations and from there, we we had you come in as our yeah, guest, <laughs> yeah, so. and we looked at where we were because we knew we wanted to focus on that um, in all grade levels because we were also looking at what robots we had. We also have Cosmo and we have Dash and where we wanted to start with them in different grade levels so that as kids moved through grades, uh, there were, you know, different extension um, experiences. Absolutely. But we also, uh, in our tech club, Bianca runs the primary tech club, which is K2, with some other teachers. We we allowed all of those robots to be part of those experiences, so we had um, primary kids with part of those, too. And so from that point on, we 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 made a plan for professional development with our, with our teacher leaders and instructional coach. And so we knew that, I think it was at the end of March, we were going to hold learning walks where grade levels of teachers would walk other grade levels to see um, what we set, whatever we set the focus for, which is something we do here often, but we set the focus for coding or creation. Mm -hmm. And so what we asked teachers to do was during their workstation time, they could pick math or literacy that they had kids engaged in either a creation station or a coding station. And many picked coding because we had those resources and people were excited about it. And the creation stations were just as powerful. Some had both elements. And, and then we provided support. So Megan was gracious to come. And as our DIS, uh, we had teachers sign up. And so what that looked like was I want to, uh, you know, I want to dig into Cubeto. I want to dig into Osmo with, um, what are the coding chips that go with that? Albi. With uh, coding Albi, coding yes. Albi. We, ha we, have, we have all the um, different games that go along with Osmo. So it could be one of those um, or Ozobot, whatever it was, Dash. And so we, we signed up in, I think, 15-minute increments, and, mm -hmm. and it was a jam-packed day, and we pulled all the resources we, resources we could, so we had multiple sets. And we went in, and Megan and Bianca, we brought her in as a, and other teacher leaders. There were a couple others that had different areas that we know they had dug into, and they ran small groups to teach the kids. But in teaching the kids, it was also teaching the teachers. Yes, And absolutely. then um, we intentionally left the, the robots behind or whatever tools we were working with and moved on to the next Next classroom so that teacher had so it transitioned into the teacher taking over the the coding experience and the class 
so they owned it a little bit more. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second because that's something that's been really different at Burgess. So my team and I do a lot of classroom support visits, um, and I think one thing that was super powerful with, within your school's plan for PD is often when we go in classrooms, we, we are owning it and teachers don't necessarily have to. So because you had the power of having so many devices, because we had um, such a tight schedule because everyone signed up, we really had to transfer it to teachers. And I think um, what really made a difference in that was when we left the classrooms, kids were in the middle of it. Like we didn't mm -hmm. finish a lesson yes. and it was done. We were in the middle of it. Um, Bianca, Bianca and I took another device to another classroom, but we left it there and kids were in the middle of it and teachers kind of had to just be in charge all of a sudden. And so they sat in our small groups and learned, but they also um, really had to take over. And we also had um, some student leaders with us. So talk about that. So we asked the teacher leaders that we knew were using the tools in their classroom, we asked them to select some student leaders to come along as well. And the idea behind that was once, once our dis left, once Megan left, we wanted to have capacity to provide support for teachers in, before we got to those learning walks at the end of March. So we said, you know, contact Bianca, contact Mandy, contact Jimmy, all those teacher leaders, and they'll come in and they'll come in for station. They also had student teachers or we would cover them, those teacher leaders that were mm -hmm. going into other classrooms. And we will cover them or they can send their student leaders and or and they can help run those those coding stations or creation stations in between the visits so that we had that that support and that expertise in between. And the student leaders really, um, well, everybody was excited, but they were amazing. And, and they just took it in and took over the group. And so we had a first grader from Bianca's room that said, you know, I've always known I wanted to teach and I wasn't so sure about going into third grade today, to, but but my small group they were they were great, and I think I can handle them. And I and I might actually think about teaching third grade someday. And at the end of the day, when we were videoing him, he said, um, I, I said, talk about your experience today. And he said, I am living my school dream. I love that. And he did such a great job. I think it beyond being powerful for students teaching each other, we had first graders teaching fourth graders how to code. Um, and I feel like as a small child, that might be a little bit intimidating, but they were so confident because yeah. they do it every day in their classroom. Bianca, you have stations going in your classroom where literally students are running them independent of you and they're coding. Um, and so they had the power and the knowledge and the tools to go into a fourth grade classroom. And they, they were, they were such little teachers. They would sit their students around them and they would model and then they would ask them questions. Um, it was amazing how they really just mimicked what they saw in their teachers every day. So asking yeah. questions and giving them a problem to solve and um, just kind of releasing it to them. So that's great. One thing that I found um, really powerful with those visits in the classroom is I felt like there were some teachers in our school that were very reluctant because yeah. they just didn't know. And even those teachers who were so reluctant that I thought would never want to, you know, have coding in their classroom because it's just really scary. Right. They took the leap and did it. And now they're using it every day in their room, which is amazing. Yeah. And there were a lot of conversations around that because our Marty, our instructional coach and I um, have a lot of conversations, both in PLCs, but then individually. And so there were, there were teachers who had a tremendous amount of angst and that was out of not knowing, not, you know, feeling like you need to be an expert so that you can help your kids. Absolutely. And so that's where some of those conversations came in. Use the teacher leaders, use the student leaders, let them come in for a whole week of stations and teach your kids while you're teaching your small group and the kids will run with it. And so that's important to us because it's an equity. It, it, it's an equity issue if if you're not building capacity and it doesn't have to happen immediately. Not everybody's going to jump in. We didn't right. have everybody jump in in o October, but we had a plan for within a reasonable amount of time that the expectation be that all classrooms have these experiences for students so that all kids have equitable access to to those tools. And it looks different. It looks. But the but the beauty of that is. Like Bianca said, we learn from each other and we think of yeah, things that absolutely. one person thinks of things that nobody else would have. In fourth grade, they're doing some amazing things with Dash in terms of measuring with centimeters and, and setting paths and then coding Dash to do that and responses and just things that I just blow my mind and angles and having um, Dash draw angles. And we've done a little bit with Root and Cosmo in third grade with that yeah. in, in a couple classrooms. So it's, it's great to see the progression of the foundational skills that they're getting with even just basic like physical block coding with Cubeto in your primary grades and how that has helped support them when they get to fourth grade. And, and now they're still using block code, but it's in an app and they're having to um, use some conditional formatting and 
and some um, loops and so forth to create those patterns. So I think it's super important as a leader, you, you, you bought the resources, but you put in um, lots of different strategies with how Bianca and other teacher leaders, how I could come in, how student leaders, and it was ongoing support. It wasn't, here's your training, we're done, do it. It was continual, it was gradual, teachers had choice of when they signed up, um, but you know, they knew what was coming. They knew there was an expectation within six months or you know, this time frame to at least try something. It didn't have to be big. And so um, I think there's so much power in just giving teachers choice, but also multiple different supports and um, repetitive as well. And, so. and then and then making sure that we did hold the learning walks yes. at the end of March, which are always, we get excited about those mm -hmm. um, because you get to go to other grade levels and walk. We walk a whole grade level every classroom, but you get ideas and you can see what grade levels below or above you are doing so that you can see what's coming to you or where your kids are going and see what those teachers are doing. So we start to see things replicate it in different formats across the school and we celebrate each other because it's really amazing to see what teachers do um, you know and and when you're in your classroom you don't get to always see all right. of those other things even within your team you hear about them planning but but it's really pretty awesome to get to go and and watch a whole grade level and have com reflective conversations around that and we did that with a rubric so I definitely think there's so much power in just seeing um, other people who do what you do every day trying something new and learning from them. It's one thing to see it online or to read it in a book, um, but to see it in action, there's just so much power in that. So um, do you offer any other kind of incentives for teachers trying new things? How do you, you know, how do you get the Biancas of the world to, to be the first one that jumps out and try things? How do you, how do you help um, kind of get leaders, whether it's for coding or anything else? I'd be interested to hear Bianca's response. <laughs> <laughs> we are very strategic. I, I, we try. So whenever you start a new initiative, what naturally comes next is the want or the need for additional resources. And so yeah. we watch. We do different things. So, for example, we have, we put Osmos out there in classrooms, and teachers loved them. And for and not with coding obby, but also with other different tools and games that right. they could use to practice academic skills. And and then we bought a, a bunch of extra bases because what you can do is have partners working on one Osmo and share the manipulatives. And so as we went around just some walkthroughs, uh, you know, I would keep bases all around the school in our different offices. And if I saw it being used, I everybody got a base in the end. But yeah. that's how, you know, great job. Thank you so much for using your Osmo. Yeah. Here's a base. And it's like Christmas, you know, Absolutely. <laughs> and so and then other tools too. like Bianca caught on pretty quick if she said, you know, this is out there for Cubetto or there's an astronomy <laughs> mat and that kind of goes along with our standards. If I could, you know, if I could, yeah. and they're not that expensive, but if we knew that they were going to be used, we would start to Absolutely. build resources in those places. And then when we use our teacher leaders, we try to do give them a little Cersei or a little yeah. something for their classroom um, as a thank you. And so we just try to do little things like that to say, you know, hey, thanks for sharing. And and I think colleagues are very appreciative of that as well. Yeah, there's lots but, of celebrating each other in this building, yeah. even on the learning walks. It's a day of, you know, just giving everybody like that kind of validation that you need, like you are working hard, someone sees it and you're doing great things. You taught me something today. And so I know that when you guys go in each other's classrooms, it's everybody gets so much positive feedback. You kind of, yeah. it kind of feels like a gift when someone visits you as well. Yeah, so. it, it, it is really nice. And I think that on the teacher side, we were just so grateful and thankful to have access to all these coding materials because it, yeah. it can get costly. And so when we do have access to them and we can use them and have them with us in our own grade level to share, um, it just makes us want to do it more and want to let the kids do it more because I feel like they're learning so much more by doing the coding and and that kind of stuff because they're excited about it. Yeah, they're, they feel High engagement. <laughs> motivated to, you know, do the work because they're doing it in a fun way that they want to do it. Well, that's great. Well, and, so and our learning library commons has been a big piece in that too. I can't yes. not talk about her um, because she has, she set up early on coming in really the previous um, person had a maker space that she's really focusing on inquiry skills and, and those skills that go into that may not always involve the technology or it may. And she has resources as well so that, you know, as kids are experiencing them and teachers pick up kids and see some of those things going on, it also 
you know, it supports the classroom it does. because she's working on some of the same skills or, or teachers can go to her and say, will you work with my class on this this week so that when they get into stations that precursor work is done. Yes, and so absolutely. that's another um, key piece. I we think. hear that from teachers all the time. I don't have time to teach them the tool. Um, and so we know that, you know, sometimes we can just give it to kids and figure it out, but there are some things that are a little more complicated and some of those coding tools really are. So it's great for, as a classroom teacher say, hey, you know what, my kids have enough background on this that it's not gonna, it's not gonna take up so much of my time to release it to a station because they have learned it um, in that shared space. I've actually gotten ideas from other teachers, you know, that time in the morning when we come in from 7.30 to 7.50 when we're unpacking and we're getting ready for our day mm -hmm. to just, hand them the iPad and say, this is the app you're exploring today and let them figure it out. And I've actually been doing that for a while now. And it helps me to get them set up to do the app later on in the week yeah. so that when the project comes along for reading and responding, they can go, go right into it and do it because they've already had the time in the morning right. to figure it out and how it works. And, you know, all of the thing, all of the tools that are involved in that app, which has been really fun and exciting for the kids. I love that for a couple of reasons. Number one, when it's academic time, they can focus on the academic skill and, and not having to worry about the troubleshooting piece. But the other thing is we're teaching kids to be self learners and mm -hmm. independent. Um, in the real life, there's not someone always around to teach us those things. So um, I think it's important that students can explore and they can teach themselves and, and you have peer support. If I don't know something, I can ask my neighbor because they've had that time too. So that's yeah. wonderful. And, and the upper grades, I'm going to share one from our fourth grade teacher. Sometimes when you go through stations for so many years, um, the accountability piece and the and the motivation for the independent work yeah. is challenging. And so one of our fourth grade teachers made Dash the Dash station an incentive in terms of if you finish your independent stations, then you get to go to the Dash yeah. coding. You must and, do, and then you can may mm -hmm. do, right? And she, and she was like, you know, suddenly all work was getting completed Amazing. well in a pretty quick <laughs> manner. So, you know, now it's part of, that was when they were learning it, and yeah. she was trying to encourage kids to, to you know, explore. explore. Yeah. Now they all have access to that in certain stations, but that was a really great way to, you know, start off. Yeah. So. so I think you've gave it, you've really given us a, a great plan on how um, you've implemented this at Burgess. But are there anything is there anything else you would suggest to other building leader, leaders so where they could start or, um, you know, where to kind of look with coding um, in their building? Any other final tips? I think, like Bianca said, part of it is the training, part of it is the support, and part of it is the tools. It's great to be able to check out the resources, but when you first learn something, if you don't dive in and play with it, I think you lose a lot of that knowledge. Yeah. So I would say just with, with coding, everybody's a learner because it's new and it's, but it is part, one thing that I learned from Hour of Code is how many jobs involve coding. Absolutely. Right now in the real world, so I can only imagine where that's leading and heading. And that was eye-opening, some of those videos, if you look that up on that website. So, you know, it is authentic and it is, it, there are skills that are, that our kids are going to need and we're doing them a disservice if we don't. So I would just say have a plan, but jump in and make sure that the tools, the the support and the and, um, you know, the learning is there and just be reflective and support one another in the journey. I, and, you know, if you don't if you don't if you don't jump in, if you wait for it to be packaged and pretty, it might not ever come and you'll be behind. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Well, I definitely can tell that your belief in it and your opinion about it has really set the tone for your building because it has carried over to your teachers. So I think that um, is one of the most powerful pieces as a leader you can do is to, to, to give teachers the freedom, but also say, you know, this is why I believe in it. This is the proof. And you've done an amazing job of that in your building. And Bianca and all your other teachers have just dug in deep and done amazing things with with They're kids awesome. and they've taught me your your students have taught me so me too. um every day yes every day <laughs> yeah. so and i think that's great that we can all be learners together so um thank you both for taking the time to sit down and share with us today we appreciate it so much and we cannot wait to stay tuned to see what else we will see from burgess thank, so thank, you. thank you thank you wow that was really great to hear great job burgess elementary keep up the good work Thanks again to Ms. Basher and Ms. Coy for taking the time out of their schedules to join us. And great job on those interview questions, Megan. Well, it looks like we're out of time. As always, all of the resources mentioned in the podcast can be found in the description. 
For more information on Cubeto, Dash, and other coding tools available to your school, please visit our YouTube channel and our various social media accounts. If you have an idea for a future podcast, please reach out to your dis or leave us a comment on YouTube. Also, if you enjoyed the podcast, subscribe, like, and leave us a five-star review. See you next time, Ori County. To continue to follow our story, please subscribe to the Discast. Thank you for joining us today, and always remember, in the words of George Kuros, technology will never replace great teachers, but technology in the hands of great teachers can be transformational. See you next time. Thank you for watching this tutorial. Be sure to subscribe, like, comment, and follow us by clicking on the links below in the description.